All right, hi, hello. Let's take a look at problem three. So in problem three, we're told that the molar enthalpy of a binary liquid system of species one and two at fixed temperature and pressure is represented by uh, this equation. So we have an equation for uh, molar enthalpy as a function of composition, where H is in joules per mole, and we're asked to determine expressions for H bar one, so the partial molar enthalpy of component one and component two as a function of X1, along with numerical values for uh, the pure species enthalpies H1 and H2, and then also the uh, limiting values of the uh, partial molar enthalpies. Okay, so let's kind of talk through everything and just look and see what we have and, um, you know, what kind of cool things we can we could see from this. So the first thing I'm going to point out is um, just looking at our expression here, okay, this is a very common way to correlate um, molar properties of mixtures, right? Specifically, molar properties of binary mixtures, okay? And why I say that is if I look at H1, or just H, okay? So, you know, I know that in the limit that, say, X1 goes to 1, right? So in the limit that I have pure component 1, what is H equal to, okay? So H is the molar enthalpy of my binary mixture. But in the limit that I have pure component 1, H should just be equal to H1, right? The molar enthalpy of pure component 1. Likewise, in the limit the X2 were to go to 1, H should be equal to H2, right? In the limit that I have pure component 2, the molar enthalpy of my mixture should just be that of pure component 2. Okay? X1 goes to 1 is equivalent to X2 goes to 0. X2 goes to 1 is equivalent to X1 goes to 0. Okay, and so now if I look at my expression, okay, so in either of these limiting cases, x1 or x2 is going to zero, okay, so this term here, right, is going to be zero, okay, and so I just need to look at these first two terms. So in the limit that x1 goes to one or x2 goes to zero, h should be equal to h1, okay, so if I look at this then, what that would tell me is that 400, right, is h1. Okay, because the limit that x1 goes to 1 or x2 goes to 0, this term is gone, as is this term. So I'm left with h is just equal to h1, <laughs> all right? Because um, that would give me my pure component limit, all right? In the same token, if I were to look at x2 goes to 1 or x1 goes to 0, I would find that 600 is h2, okay? And so why this is interesting then, so if I look at this term, right, what does that correspond to? Well, as we'll show uh, in, or as we show in our uh, property changes upon mixing uh, screencast and notes, um, I know I can write H as being sum over I, Xi, Hi plus delta H of mixing. Okay, so what we have then, you know, for a binary system is, and I'm going to rearrange it to take this form, right? H1 x1 plus h2 x2 plus delta h of mixing. Okay, so this last term then here, okay, must correspond to delta h of mixing. Okay, this is my mixing term. All right, so this gives me delta h of mixing as a function of composition because delta h of mixing is going to change with respect to composition. Okay, um, and then you know. Essentially, what I have is I have x1 times x2 times, this is just a linear expression, right? And so, in general, this could be any old polynomial, okay? So, a common practice is going to be to correlate delta H of mixing as a function of x1, x2 times some arbitrary polynomial, right? Um, the more complicated your system is, the more terms you might have uh, in your polynomial expression, okay? But I multiply by x1, x2 so that I make sure I achieve my pure limiting conditions, right? So physically this makes sense, right? So this is delta H of mixing. I need to make sure my pure component limits delta H of mixing is zero. So how I make sure that delta H of mixing goes to zero in my pure component limits is I just multiply by this term x1, x2, right? So if I'm in the limit of pure one, uh, then x2 is zero. If I'm in the limit of pure two, um, then x1. Okay, I, I think I, so in the limit that I have pure x1, x2 is 0, and the limit that I have pure x2, x1 is 0. So in either of those limiting cases, 
right? I have a zero here, and this term goes away, right? Delta H of mixing goes to zero in my pure component limits. I get the correct limiting values, all right? And then in parentheses here, I can use any old uh, order polynomial I want to correlate my delta H of mixing or property change of mixing data, okay? And so what I'm trying to say is when you see new, um, analytic equations for um, molar properties of a mixture, a binary mixture, you'll often see them presented in this form, right? And so it's molar average of my pure component systems plus x1, x2 times some polynomial expression. This is my property change upon mixing term, which is going to go to zero of my pure component limits, okay? So you'll see this come up a lot. When we talk about excess Gibbs free energy later on, this is going to come up a lot where we make sure that goes to zero of my pure component limits, okay? Um, yeah, okay, but uh, I digress, okay? So getting back on topic, um, and then in terms of what they want, well, we kind of jumped ahead, right? And they want expressions for, or numerical values for H1 and H2. We already calculated those just by looking at the limiting conditions. Um, we could also show how you could get those another way. But what I see is I'm gonna need expressions for my partial molar enthalpies and then um, the limiting values, okay? Um, and, you know, in the same token, in the limit that x1 were to go to 1, h bar 1 is just equal to h1, right? And so if I had expressions for my partial molar enthalpies, which we're asked to calculate next, all right? So then likewise, um, those limiting values, so the values of my partial molar enthalpies and the pure component limits are just gonna be equal to those pure component molar values, okay? Um, but anyways, so if I wanna get expressions for partial molar enthalpy, I kind of have two options, okay? There's the foul-proof option that works for all cases, no matter how many components you have in your system, and we'll talk about what that would look like. Um, but then the preferred way for binary systems is gonna to be to use those simplified equations that we just worked out in our um, screencast to work out simplified expressions to calculate partial molar properties in binary mixtures, okay? Um, so I'll peek over that in a second, but first I'm going to tell you how these things would work in general, okay? Um, and, you know, you know, on another note then, in terms of working out how these would work out in general, another motivation for using this common functional form to correlate data is if you were to work out expressions for my partial molar enthalpies um, in this general way, once I do it once, as long as I stick to this functional form, I have solutions for, you know, whatever equation, um, whatever coefficients or constants I would regress for, for a given system. Okay. So anyways, so the, the traditional foul proof approach would be our definition of say partial molar enthalpy of component I would be partial, okay, N times H or H total partial NI keeping everything else constant. Okay. So for my binary system, I would have the H bar one is partial and H partial and one at constant T P and N two. And likewise, H bar two would be partial and H partial and two at constant T P and N one. Okay, cool. Okay, so how do I do this? Okay, so um, without looking up at my expression, Okay, I know it's going to be of this general form, h is equal to uh, h1x1 plus h2x2 plus x1x2, um, and let's just say uh, constant times x1 plus uh, constant times x2. Okay, and you can look up the, the values, okay? I'm actually gonna, you know, perform the calculation just because it becomes a little cumbersome, okay? So if I look at our definitions of partial molar enthalpies, okay, a couple of issues arrive. So first, what I actually need an expression for is my x sense of h, okay? Um, and so we'll plug that in a second. And then the other issue that comes up is I need to differentiate my x sense of h with respect to the moles of each species, okay? And so how I would do that is, well, n is gonna be equal to n1 plus n2, okay? And then what I'm gonna to have to do is substitute in for x1 and x2, x1 is equal to n1 divided by n1 plus n2, and x2 is equal to 
and 2 divided by n1 plus n2. Okay, so first thing I would do, or it, the order really doesn't matter, uh, but I would have to multiply through by n. And by n, I'm going to use n1 and n2, right? n1 plus n2, since I'm differentiating with respect to the moles of a specific species holding the other constant. And then I'm going to have to make a replacement for um, x1 and x2. I'm going to use you know n1 plus over n total and n2 over uh, n total. Okay. Uh, so the first two terms wouldn't be bad because that n I'm multiplying by would cancel out the denominator. Uh, but in here, um, it doesn't quite work out uh, exactly the same. Okay, um, and so it just becomes a little complicated to, to differentiate. Okay, but um, you know, in the interest of just showing what that would look like, I suppose, uh, what would I have? So n h. Okay, let me just use n for now. Uh, I'll have n h one. And then x1 would be n1 divided by n, okay, plus uh, n times h2, n2 over n, plus n times x1 over n, x oh n1 over n. Ah. So I would have n times n1 over n times n2 over n times constant uh, n1 over n plus constant times n2 over n. Okay, so uh, you know, these n's would cancel, so I have n1 h1 plus n's cancel n2 h2 plus, okay, let's cancel that n, uh, and then I'll have, in, so distribute so I'll have uh, n1 squared n2 over, so n1 squared n2 over n squared uh, times constant a1 plus n1 n2 squared over n squared a2. Okay, so long as I haven't goofed anything up. Okay, or finally nh would be then n1 h1 plus n2 h2. Okay, remember these are just constants, those are just my uh, pure component values. Plus, now this is n1 squared n2 divided by n1 plus n2 squared. Okay, and if you want, you can expand that out. Uh, that's times a1 plus <clears throat> n1 n2 squared divided by n1, whoop, n1 plus n2 squared times a2, all right, and then I guess you'd probably want to expand out that denominator before you attempt this animal, but I guess it doesn't really matter, because this would just be, say, you know, variable of interest plus a constant squared, and so you could leave it as this. So basically I would have this expression that I would need to work out the differential for uh, in my two cases. All right, then I have h bar 1 and h bar 2. Okay, And then you're not even done yet because it says it wants um, an expression as a function of x1. So once you actually do work out the differential, well then you would go back and you'd have to, you know, resubstitute, you know, okay, x1 is n1 over n1 plus n2. Um, and if you wanted to use x2s in there too, you can go back and substitute in that x2 is n2 over n1 plus n2, okay? And then once you had an expression for h bar 1 and h bar 2, okay, um, you know, we already showed how you could get h1 and h2 from my expression for um, the h of my mixture, molar h of my mixture, um, but again, you know, I'm sorry if I'm repetitive, but the limit that um, x1 goes to 1, h bar 1 is equal to h1, and likewise, the limit that x1 goes to 0, h bar 1, okay, we call that the um, infinite dilution value, okay, or the limiting value, okay. And limiting values come up often uh, because essentially they correspond to maximum deviations from uh, ideality. <laughs> now, we haven't talked about uh, ideal solutions yet, but the general idea is um, an ideal solution is going to be a solution which all of our intermolecular interactions are exactly the same, right? So molecules completely comfortable. 
And so where the limiting values um, are of significance is they would correspond to, say in this case, of a single molecule of component one in uh, component two. Right, so it's as non-ideal or as far away from that idealized limit as you could possibly get. Okay, um, and so they can be useful because they can, you know, they correspond to maximum deviations from ideality, so they they're indicative of, of that. Um, but then also, if it's just say a single molecule of component one uh, in pure solvent, um, then that's going to be representative of the uh, interactions between uh, component one and two. Right, there's no one-one interactions whatsoever. Okay, and you could do the same thing for component two. Uh, and then how we'll end this is, so in terms of there must be an easier way, well, go and look at um, our screencast for computing partial molar properties of binary mixtures, where we take advantage of some properties, right? We go through the same discussion we just had. Uh, but what you can find is that for the case of a binary system, um, so here I have it at F bar two, but it'd be say H bar two, partial molar enthalpy of component two is just molar enthalpy of my mixture minus x1 times a uh, derivative of my molar uh, enthalpy uh, versus uh, with respect to x1, right? So I could just evaluate a derivative uh, with respect to um, x1, okay? And just a note, if you were to work with this expression, um, in my expression for h, I would need to get rid of x2, so I would just replace x2 with 1 minus x1 before I work out this derivative, right? So again, if I were to use this expression, okay, Going back here, all right, we have x1 and x2 in our expression for h. I would go and I would replace x2 with 1 minus x1. Okay? That way I could actually evaluate this derivative. Okay? Um, or if you wanted to, if you wanted to use x2, you could use x2. dx2 is just 1 negative dx1. Right? So you could flip, but you just need to have only one. Right? x1 and x2 are not independent, they're related, so you just need to have either x1 or x2 in your expression. Okay, your choice. All right, and then here's the expression for you know f bar one. Again, uh, first derivative with respect to x1. Uh, here I have x2, but x2 is just one minus x1, uh, so they're interchangeable. Okay, cool. So that is problem three.